I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and, and thanks for coming over and, and, and joining us for the afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk about blue carbon in Southern California salt marsh ecosystems and some of the stuff that I've been doing at Chapman exploring uh, blue carbon in Southern California uh, salt marsh ecosystems. Uh, I thought I'd start off with a definition of blue carbon just to make sure that we all sort of have a solid ground layer understanding of what I'm really talking about here. And this is the definition that's provided by NOAA, although it's similar to lots of other definitions that you'll find out there. Blue carbon is this idea that salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrass beds are able to absorb large quantities of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide and store it. Right? So we're talking about these coastal vegetated ecosystems that are sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The plants take care of that for us. And then these ecosystems store that blue carbon, store that carbon uh, for long periods of time, either as vegetation or more importantly as soil organic matter. Okay? What I want to do today is, is spend a little bit of time talking about the ecology of blue carbon. Why do we have blue carbon? Why does it work? Why is it that coastal systems are so important and so different from other ecosystems in terms of how they store carbon? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my own research. Uh, I'm unfortunately going to show you some data. Uh, I'm going to try really hard to focus less on the numbers and more on the stories uh, behind those data and the types of questions that I'm thinking about right now as I, as I get into this blue carbon uh, uh, research area. Um, I'd love for this to be an open conversation, so if something's not clear or people want to slow down or challenge me or tell me I'm wrong, I'm happy to, to have that happen. Um, standing up and giving another lecture after multiple lectures already today is, is not high on my list of priorities. So please feel free to pipe up and slow me down or speed me up or tell me to skip over the numbers and get to another picture or whatever you see fit to contribute. Okay. So um, I stole this from the Bolsa Chica webpage, which is a lovely webpage for whoever put that together. Um, and this idea that I think everybody in this room and in this audience, I don't need to convince you that wetlands have lots of value, right? We know that they're important breeding grounds for birds. We know that they provide lots of habitat. We know that they support fisheries, right? We know that they're really good at water. Uh, and air clean, or water pollution cleanup and mitigation and all these sorts of things. Wetlands have lots of values. What I want to do is try and convince you that an added value, and one that's not yet on your webpage, is that wetlands are really important and have a value when we think about global carbon cycling. So I'm an ecosystem ecologist by training. I lose my ecosystem ecologist card if I don't have at least one box and arrow diagram in every talk I give. So this is going to be my box and arrow diagram to prove that I really know what I'm talking about. Uh, imagine, if you will, that this box with these plants represents Bolsa Chica or any wetland that we find in the environment. When we think about carbon cycling, this is really what we're talking about. Right? We know that plants are able to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis. This is how plants make more plants. Right? This is what they do. We know that eventually those plants are going to die and are going to be decomposed by microbes. Microbes colonize those senescent plant materials. They begin to decompose them and use the plant material for food. Right? Microbes respire the same way we respire. They need food. We get a sandwich. They get dead plants. Okay? And in doing so, these wetland microbes are actually releasing carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, exactly the same way that you release carbon dioxide every time that you exhale. Right? Wetland microbes have the ability to respire in a number of different ways. They can do it exactly the same way that you're respiring right now, but in some, in some instances they actually do it in a very, very different way. And rather than releasing carbon dioxide, they can also release methane as a respiratory byproduct. Okay? So they're eating the dead plants as food. Instead of exhaling carbon dioxide, they actually exhale methane. Okay? And this is important when we think about carbon cycling because we know that methane is a particularly potent greenhouse gas. We know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It's responsible for trapping heat on the earth right, and making the earth warmer the more carbon dioxide we find in the atmosphere. Methane does the same thing. But the chemistry of methane allows methane to do it even better. So one methane in the atmosphere is as good as about 25 or 28 carbon dioxides in the atmosphere. So it's very good at leading to a warmer planet. All right? So we've got carbon dioxide coming into our wetland through photosynthesis, being formed into plant organic matter. The plants die, they're decomposed by microbes, and then the carbon returns back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide or methane. Okay? Now, those things don't always have to happen in perfect balance. 
So the amount of carbon dioxide coming in through photosynthesis does not have to be equal to the amount of carbon dioxide and methane that returns to the atmosphere through microbial respiration. Sometimes there's a disconnect there. Right? And in wetlands, that disconnect works in this way. There's more carbon dioxide coming in than there is going out, which means that you have extra carbon that sticks around in the wetlands, and it tends to stick around in the wetlands in the form of soil carbon, right, or soil organic matter. Okay? And wetlands, when we talk about wetlands in terms of a, a, a value of wetlands, and carbon cycling as a value of wetlands, it's important to realize that wetlands this carbon cycle stuff plays out on a global scale. So wetlands, if you look at all the wetlands on the planet right now, in the form of soil carbon, so the carbon that they store in their soil, we're talking about about 500 petagrams of carbon. That's 500 times 10 to the 15th, so 500 with 15 zeros after it, grams of carbon in wetland soils on, the, on a global scale. Right? That's about 60 times more carbon than we release annually from fossil fuel, fuel burning. So it's a really, really globally significant amount of carbon that is locked up in these wetlands because of this disconnect between the carbon coming in and the carbon going out. Wetlands also play a really important role in the global cycling of methane, this potent greenhouse gas. We know that wetlands on a global scale are responsible for about 25% of the flux of methane to the atmosphere. Okay? So one of the additional values of wetlands is that they play a really crucial role in regulating global climate. Right? Over geological time, we know that wetlands have played an important role in warming and cooling events on the Earth's history. All right, good. This would be a fine time to break in with questions or arguments if you have them, but if not, I'll keep plowing ahead. So this carbon cycling works for any wetland that we can imagine on the planet. So I am actually, by training, a peatland ecologist. I spend most of my time in northern Minnesota and northern Michigan looking at bogs and fen ecosystems, and I can use this same diagram I can use this same diagram to explain how carbon cycling works in those nor northern peatland ecosystems. But blue carbon and this idea of coastal carbon cycling implies that there's something really different about coastal ecosystems. And indeed there is. Okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is that makes coastal ecosystems unique and how carbon cycling works in these coastal environments that makes them different than other wetland environments. This graph here on the left uh, for you, my other box and arrow diagrams here, is fairly complicated. What it has to do with is this idea that wetlands can respire in multiple ways. Okay? So as I said, wetlands have the ability to break down organic matter, to eat dead plants in the same way that you eat your food. That's that diagram on the top. Right? We're here. Wetlands are taking dead plants as their food and they're using oxygen in the same way you breathe oxygen to break that food down, and they're releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Okay? One of the things that makes wetlands so unique is the fact that they're wet. Right? It's not very exciting there. And under these, anaerobe, or under these flooded conditions, you don't have oxygen. So if you're a microbe that lives below the water table level, out here at Bolsa Chica, below that low tide line, you never actually see any oxygen because there's none there. Oxygen does a horrible job of dissolving in water. If you're one of those microbes that lives in that constantly flooded, constantly saturated environment, you therefore are experiencing what biogeochemists call anaerobic conditions, which just basically means low oxygen conditions. Now your food source, dead plants, is still around in those environments. But now when you're trying to consume those dead plants as your food source, you can't breathe oxygen. You have to breathe other things. And microbes can breathe a whole host of other things. So microbes can breathe nitrate in the process of denitrification. This is one of the values of wetlands for actually cleaning up nitrogen off of the landscape. Denitrification takes nitrate from water, converts it into nitrous gas or dinitrogen gas that goes back into the atmosphere. It's a, it's a way that you can get nitrogen out of water bodies and into the atmosphere and remove uh, nitrogen eutrophication. Some microbes can also breathe sulfate in the process of sulfate reduction. You know what this is if you've ever smelled a rotten egg. Rotten eggs are also environments that don't have any oxygen. They have lots of organic matter for those microbes to eat. Microbes there are breathing sulfate and they produce hydrogen sulfide. Right? This is very common in salt marshes as well. It's why salt marshes periodically smell like rotten eggs. Right? And down here at the very bottom we have these microbes that can actually breathe carbon dioxide. 
and produce the potent greenhouse gas methane. Now, one of the reasons that um, wetlands store so much organic carbon, why we've got this huge pile of carbon stored in wetland soils, is because this is an energy gradient, right? So biogeochemists would call this a thermodynamic gradient. What it means is that microbes can actually get more energy out of organic matter, more energy out of the food, the higher up they are on this chain. So if microbes have oxygen available, they're going crazy. They can crank through dead leaves. They can turn that stuff over really, really fast. It's not going to persist for long periods of time in the environment. If they don't have oxygen and they have to use these alternative processes, dead leaves, the dead organic matter, tends to persist for longer periods of time. So the fact that wetlands are wet is why they're so important in the global carbon cycle, because they have these inefficient pathways of microbial processing, which leads to this buildup of dead plants and wetland soils. All right. Now, in coastal environments, so remember we said that one of the things that wetlands also do is produce this greenhouse gas methane, right? That's not something that we want to try and maximize when we're thinking about carbon storage wetlands, right? In coastal wetlands, seawater has very high concentrations of sulfate. So in coastal wetlands, when you have these anaerobic conditions, low oxygen conditions, microbes have to use these alternative pathways. And the one they use most often tends to be sulfate reduction, right? Because there's a constant supply of sulfate coming in with the tide. Does that make sense? Are we good? Right? What this means is that if microbes are using this pathway, and there's a thermodynamic gradient here, an energy gradient here, they're not using this pathway. So one of the first things that makes coastal ecosystems so unique in their carbon cycling is that you don't have methane production in these coastal environments. Okay? So if you're thinking about blue carbon as a way to store carbon and help mitigate climate change, and we'll show that that's what a lot of this conversation is about, the fact that these coastal systems don't produce methane makes them really unique compared to inland wetlands or freshwater wetlands. It's, it's never produced under any situation? Ah, an excellent question. It can be, right? It tends not to be produced until you use up all of the sulfate, right? So if these things sit long enough and the microbes have the ability to breathe, so right, if I put you in a box, right, you'd keep using all the oxygen, but eventually the oxygen levels would go down. If you have an environment where there's not tidal exchange, and that sulfate that comes in with the tide water is able to sit there for long enough, the microbes can use up all of that sulfate in the same way that you would use up all the oxygen in the box, in which case they do switch to this less efficient pathway and can actually start producing methane. Is there a known range for that? There is a known range for that. You need to get down pretty low in terms of sulfate concentration before this is allowed to actually happen. And I'll show you some data to show that that's pretty well documented in the scientific literature. Okay? The other thing that we have in a lot of these Southern California salt marshes is lots of iron. That's not up here, but iron, iron 3, rust, is another thing that microbes can breathe. So there are microbes that instead of breathing oxygen can actually breathe rust in the soil, and that is also more favorable than methane. So you need to get rid of all the iron first, then you need to get rid of all the sulfide, sulfate, and then you can start making methane. Right. So these systems are pretty well poised not to make a whole lot of methane unless they're stagnant for long periods of time. Okay. Now, I understand that Bolsa Chica, like other Southern California wetland complexes, does have some brackish areas and does even have some freshwater wetland areas. If you're trying to think about the entire complex, you might have some hot spots in those freshwater areas that don't have that sulfate, don't have the iron, and could be producing methane. Okay. Great questions. Those are pretty small areas. They are pretty small areas. But remember that with this high um, global warming potential and the high potency of methane, if you're really trying to do a greenhouse gas balance for the entire complex, very small areas producing a very potent greenhouse gas can have really big impacts on the landscape scale. Um, OK, good. So uh, the first thing that makes uh, coastal vegetated ecosystems unique in terms of their carbon cycling is they don't produce methane. The second thing that makes coastal ecosystems unique in their carbon cycling and, and thinking about blue carbon and soil carbon storage is that they're coastal, which means that for Bolsa Chica wetlands and salt marshes that to continue to exist, right, they need to be able to keep pace with sea level rise. Right? And this is a real problem for lots of salt marshes around the world. They need to be able to keep pace with sea level rise. 
right? So, it, it, right, there's a, we, we know that salt marshes and salt marsh plants in particular have a relatively narrow range of tide levels that they can actually survive and thrive in. And if sea level rise happens too quickly or too dramatically, you basically flood them out, okay? Bolsa Chica obviously hasn't had this happen. It's still here. We can see the vegetation out in the salt marsh, which means that the wetland itself has continued to accrete through time. And this is really different than an inland freshwater ecosystem, right? They don't have this pressure to constantly add new soil to keep themselves around. So if we're thinking about why salt marshes are really good at storing soil organic carbon, decomposition is slow. The decomposition that, composition that does take place doesn't produce methane. And also, for these things to even persist, they need to constantly be adding new and new layers of carbon, new and new layers of soil. And every time you add a new layer of soil, now you're storing that carbon in that new layer of soil. Okay? So these two things make coastal ecosystems and this idea of blue carbon ecosystems particularly adept at storing carbon in their soils. So coastal vegetative systems work differently than other systems. They don't produce methane. They constantly have to accrete new soil layers, which means they store lots of carbon. Right. How much carbon are we talking about? How good are these coastal systems at storing carbon compared to other ecosystems? There's been a lot of work on this, and this is data that you can find pretty readily in the literature right now. So what this graph is showing you, this is not graph uh, data that I've collected. This is graph that other, uh, data that other scientists have suggest, uh, collected. And what we're looking at basically here is the amount of carbon that different ecosystems store per area. Okay, so in a given acre or a given hectare of various ecosystems, how much carbon do you store in that area? The brown bars here represent carbon that you store in the soil, and the green bars here represent carbon that you store in biomass, basically in plants, above and below ground plant ecosystems. Here's all of our coastal ecosystems, so seagrass beds, salt marsh, mangroves uh, in estuaries, or mangroves more closely affiliated with the ocean, open ocean. And here we have the lushest, most dense tropical rainforest that you can think about, right? An ecosystem that we are primed to think is very, very, very carbon rich. And what you see is that these coastal ecosystems on a per area basis actually store more carbon than even the densest tropical rainforest. Right? And if you look at the carbon just in their soils, right, these coastal blue carbon ecosystems win by a landslide. Right? We're talking about orders of magnitude, more carbon stored in the soil of a mangrove ecosystem than is stored in a tropical rainforest. Okay? Because of those different eco ecological conditions that we talked about, these systems are really good at this. Okay? Is soil carbon more st stably sequesters? Yeah. Right, it does tend to be locked up for long periods of time, right? That's another really excellent point, is that this carbon that they store on a per area basis oftentimes has been accumulating very slowly, but it can be hundreds or even thousands of years old. And there's some important conservation implications of that. Okay? So what scientists are doing, and there's a number of people working on this right now, they're taking data like this that look at how much carbon we have per area, then we've begun to actually finally get pretty good numbers that look at the total area of these de different ecosystems around the world, right? So this is just a map showing where you actually find seagrass beds in green, where you find salt marshes in yellow, and where you find mangroves in orange. And what you can do now is combine these two data sets and say, well, now on a global scale, how much carbon do we find in seagrass beds? How much carbon do we find in mangroves? And how much carbon do we find in salt marshes, okay? And people have done that, right? And the numbers are here. This is a table. You're never supposed to show tables and talks. I did it anyway. Forgive me. Right? The point of it is there's a lot. What I'm showing, the reason why I chose to, to show this table is it comes back to your, your question. The conservation implications of this are, I think, really, really important. So what these authors did is they said, here's the area of all these different ecosystems, and the numbers don't matter, right? And what they asked is, these are ecosystems, as you all know, that we're losing from the landscape at really alarming rates, right? So salt marshes, we estimate that we're losing about 2% of all the salt marshes left on the planet per year right now, right? Anywhere from 1% to 3% of mangroves and anywhere from half a percent to 3% of all the mangroves that are left on the planet are being lost right now. 
Now, if those ecosystems are lost and converted into non-wetland ecosystems, where they're not wet, where decomposition isn't slow, what's going to happen to all that soil carbon that's built up there for hundreds or even thousands of years? It's going to go back into the atmosphere in a really real way as the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide with potentially important implications for climate change. Okay? Potentially important implications for climate. And that's what they're trying to show here. So they show in this uh, analysis that's, that was just published a couple of years ago that when you combine all these numbers and you look at carbon storage and you look at area and you look at loss rates, you lose something like, you know, somewhere on the order of half a petagram of carbon dioxide per year going up into the atmosphere, right, because of the loss of these coastal blue carbon ecosystems on a global scale. So that's half with 15 zeros after it grams of carbon dioxide that goes up into the atmosphere because of the loss of these coastal ecosystems on a global scale. And just for sort of some scale here, and to help put some perspective and some bounds on this, fossil fuel use, right, on a global scale is 30 petagrams. So, you know, half compared to 30, those, you know, it's not the same as all the fossil fuel reburn, reburn but that's a real number. Right? A half a unit compared to a total of 30 that we release from fossil fuels, that's a globally significant number, a globally significant amount of carbon dioxide that's going back into the atmosphere. And again, this question that you asked is really insightful. It's really old carbon. It's carbon that has been in these coastal systems for hundreds or thousands of years that's now suddenly back into the atmosphere. Let me Please. challenge that. Please. State. These coastal systems suffer from sea level rise mm -hmm. in many places around the world. And those areas chases these wetlands inland. Mm -hmm. does this mm -hmm. And as they get chased inland, the pre existing coastal wetlands get uh, submerged deeper and deeper and subject in the process to wave action that must simply destroy that old soil. That's right. In a, in a geological time frame, in a relatively short time frame, thousands of years. In contrast to, say, the peat marshes that you'd studied before, where, where the carbon gets uh, deposited in the, into the soil that the you know, materials get bolded and gets turned into coal. Into fossil fuel. In the long run. Sure, sure. Or the, or the carbon that sediments to the bottom of the deep sea and gets turned into petroleum products in the long run. Right. But I'm a little surprised that uh, at your thought that those coastal systems would work in the same way as the real continental ones or the deep ocean ones, because I see them as turning over more rapidly than those others. So it's true. I mean, these are not the same as deep sea systems, and they're certainly not the same as peatlands, right? And sort of the, uh, I think the perseverance of coastal blue carbon may be at a different scale when we're talking about the geological time scale. Right? You do have this constant change of sea level rise, where when sea level rise goes up, you have this inland migration. Right? When sea level rise goes down, you have a coastal migration of these wetlands that are influenced by the tide. So that certainly does play out on a different dynamic. We can do dating of these things, though. And we know that a lot of our existing salt marshes have existed, you know, our, our, our coast has been a coast for some time, and these wetlands have been there. Now, you know, was Bolsa Chica 10,000 years ago slightly more coastal? Or was it slightly more inland, depending on what sea level rise was doing 10,000 years ago? Yeah, but realize that what you're talking about is as you lose a wetland on the, on the coast side, you're also gaining that wetland area on the inland side, right? Does that sort of make sense? So I think that balances out a little bit of what we're talking about here. But it's true. I mean, these things are really dynamic systems, especially compared to the peatland ecosystems that you bring up. Um, so I think there is, there is definitely a lot of value in that. These may not be more stable, but on the time scale that we're talking about of the past 150 years or 200 years or so, which is really what we're looking at when we're trying to put this in the same time scale as, as fossil fuel burning, I think most of these systems have probably been relatively stable. Would you buy that more? Uh, I worry that what humans are doing is putting carbon into the atmosphere right. for the long That's right. 
that the turnover of carbon in leaves or even in the trunks of trees is such a short run process that growing a tree to sequester carbon is practically pointless. Uh, so I agree with that 100%. All, all so and that's a lot of so against the production of CO2 in the first place. I'm more, more, more radical. <laughs> no, I think so. So, I mean, I think, we, we, and I'll show you the next slide that we start to talk about another way to think about this, right? So, this is carbon that we know has been there for at least a couple hundred years. We're not talking here, these loss rates are not loss rates due to natural sea level rise, right? This is loss rates due to anthropogenic activities, right? Even if that carbon is only 50 years old, Right or a hundred years old, which it's it's not. But I think these things are more persistent than that on average. But even if it's only a hundred years old or fifty years old, this still represents a major pulse of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It could be stopped if we could find a way to conserve these ecosystems. So I agree with you. Are, are we are we closer to the same page? Really great questions. And I'm certainly in agreement with preserving these, these right. systems. Right. Good. Yeah. Other thoughts or comments? Well, I'm just curious. Um, cementing of the rivers. Is that going to affect the sedimentation rate as well? Yeah. Involving in the system. So all these things, right? So sediment starved wetlands that are now more prone and not able to keep pace with sea level rise, you run the risk of these things getting lost, uh, the carbon in those things getting lost as well, right? So there's a myriad number of factors that can cause these things to change on the landscape. Some of them are natural, right? Over longer geological time scales, where you stat, um, can be, sea level rise can be quick in certain scenarios. Some of them are anthropogenic direct, right? We convert it to a shrimp farm, right? Some of them are sort of indirect anthropogenic activities like cementing of rivers, right? And then there's all these feedback loops with sea level rise going faster because of climate change, which causes these things to get flooded out and you lose them faster and faster. So lots of factors that are coming at play here. Uh, I think what I really want to get across from this conversation so far is that these things do store carbon. They store a lot of carbon. They store more carbon than any other ecosystem on the planet in their soils. And that if we lose them, that carbon goes to the atmosphere, oftentimes in relatively high rates. Yeah, please. So when you say that the carbon is, when we lose a wetland and the carbon is released into the atmosphere, physically, how is it released? Is it when they bulldoze and the soils are stirred up? How does it So a lot of it, exactly yeah, it's a great question. Happen? Right, and there's probably lots of ways that it can happen, and then you has some interesting questions about well, what happens if it gets lost because of sea level rise, and does that carbon then stick around there forever? A lot of what people are thinking about from this is just the fact that when you destroy these coastal environments, or dramatically change these coastal environments, one of the major changes is you, you dry them out, right. you drain them. And if you dry them out, you suddenly force the microbes back up to that very efficient oxygen level. Right? Remember, the whole reason, or one of the main reasons why the carbon sticks around there for so long is because there's no oxygen for these microbes. And that's because they're wetlands. As soon as they become uplands, now the microbes have oxygen, or that's the idea. Right? And this is kind of big picture hand waving. An individual wetland at an individual site is going to have interesting biogeochemistry and ecology of its own. It's probably purely unique, right? But um, this is the big picture, picture, the big picture idea of how people are thinking about this right now. Okay. So the first conservation consequence of this is if we continue to lose these coastal wetlands at really high rates, we lose the carbon that's already stored there. Okay. The other, um, I think, interesting and even more interesting conservation issue or management issue is not just this pool of carbon this chunk or block of carbon that we have, and we talk about the amount of carbon per area, we also lose the ability for them to sequester carbon in the future, right? So we can think, ecosystem ecologists think about pools and fluxes. Up till now, I've been talking about the pool of carbon, the mass of carbon stored in a soil per area. We can also talk about the intake of new carbon, the rate of carbon that comes into these ecosystems, okay? Here we're doing a similar comparison. We're looking at our coastal vegetated ecosystems compared to a variety of more terrestrial ecosystems. Notice that this is a not linear scale. Every step up here is a factor of 10. And if you look at the rate of these systems to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and ultimately convert it into soil, it's quite high, right? These systems have very, very high carbon sequestration potentials. This is something that people are really interested in when we start thinking about mitigation techniques. So carbon dioxide is going up in the atmosphere because of anthropogenic activities. 
We know that that's a major driver of, of anthropogenic climate change, right? There is a rush right now to try and find things that take processes that take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it somewhere else for long periods of time. California has carbon markets that have been developed in the past couple of years to do this, right? AB 32 allows for these types of mechanisms to actually have economic value for some of the first time ever. So maybe, just maybe, and there are lots of maybes here, but maybe, just maybe, that creates an economic incentive for wetland restoration, right? If carbon suddenly has a dollar value, now we maybe have an economic incentive to conserve wetlands, because we don't want to lose them anymore, because they're going to put carbon in the atmosphere, which is not good. If carbon has an economic value, maybe, just maybe, now we have an economic incentive to restore wetlands, or to create new wetlands to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Now, how much of an incentive that is depends on how much carbon is worth, right? which is a very, very hard question to answer, especially for somebody that has no background in economics. I don't know if this is actually going to be a legitimate economic incentive to restore more wetlands in Southern California, but the potential is there. And, and what I will say is that there is a lot of interest in thinking about this. This idea that blue carbon can now create incentives to conserve or restore or create coastal vegetated environments is something that lots of people are looking at. Ecologists like myself are very interested in this. How do you quantify the amount of carbon that's actually in Bolsa Chica right now, right? In a way that you can do if you're a consultant without having to spend $100,000 just to measure the carbon that's there. That, it turns out, is a really hard thing to do. How do you create good ecological models that don't just tell you how much carbon is there right now, but that tell you how much more carbon there's going to be in 100 years? That's a really hard ecological thing to do. Consulting groups are very interested in this. Carbon trading groups are very interested in this. There are a number of groups out there that exist in this carbon trading and carbon marking env market environment where their entire job is to put together protocols that you use to do this, to document how much carbon you have now and how much carbon you'll have in 100 years. Many of them are working to develop those protocols for post salt market. Okay? Um, economic folks are interested in this. The World Bank is interested in this. There's really interesting sustainable development consequences of this, right? So imagine a company like Indonesia that has lots and lots of mangrove ecosystems that are really, really good at sequestering carbon. Right now, there's lots of economic incentives, if you live in that environment, to cut those mangroves down and convert it to shrimp farms. Because you don't make any money from a mangrove being there. You make money from selling shrimp. What if, through these mechanisms, we can now tell an Indonesian <coughs> community, hey, these mangroves that you have are actually quite valuable. Here's how much carbon they suck out of the atmosphere every year. Here's how much that carbon's worth. We're going to pay you to keep those mangroves right where they are instead of destroying them and converting them to shrimp farms. Right? Again, there's lots of maybes there. We are not at that point yet. I am not saying that is happening, but that's the potential that people are interested in. So now we have a market mechanism that allows Indonesia or any place else that has these coastal ecosystems to keep them there while still maintaining and sustaining their own economic livelihoods as a community. So there's a lot of interest in this. Right, closer to home, I'm not going to go through the details of this. NOAA is thinking a lot about this. Restore America's estuaries is thinking a lot about this. There are many groups in the United States very concerned with the conservation and restoration of coastal environments that are spending a lot of time thinking about how we build policies and how we create economic incentives to make these sorts of things a reality. We're not there yet. We probably won't be there yet for at least years, if not decades. But this is the conversation that's happening around these blue carbon issues. I hope it doesn't take decades. Well, you know, policy is notorious for being fast and efficient, as it, as it works, especially <laughs> complicated policy like this. Um, so, but I think it's I think it's really intriguing, right? I mean, and I think you know, the policy folks, of course, say, well, what we need is more science. Which, you know, as a scientist, I see. Yeah, right. The scientists say, well, what we need is policies that fund science. So, you know, there's this constant thing that happens anytime you have science and policy interfacing. But people from all of these different areas are starting to think about this and starting to think about what it means. There's all kinds of questionable legal things, right? 
you all were going to restore uh, Bolsa Chica or conserve uh, Bolsa Chica long before you were thinking about blue carbon. I think that's fair, but please correct me if I'm wrong. So for these carbon offsets or these carbon sequestration mechanisms to count right now, they have to be viewed as additional, right? Which means that in order to get credits for carbon and sell carbon back onto a carbon market, you need to document that that carbon would have never been stored there otherwise, right? That's tricky when you think about wetland restoration. Wetland restoration, in many cases, is already legally mandated, or at least ma legally encouraged, through Section 404 Clean Water Permits. Is anything additional if you already have to create or restore a wetland already, right? There's really interesting conversations that I think, unfortunately, are, are making this something that we need to think thoughtfully about rather than just plow forward, but there's really good progress being made uh, on, on all of these issues right now. Other questions, comments? Let me show you just, um, I promised some data, and everybody was, was excited about that. I saw your eyes light up. <laughs> yeah, data, this is what we're here for. Let me show you some of the work that I've been doing with my students at, at, at Chapman that hopefully brings us back down to a little bit more of a Southern California perspective. Uh, I've been measuring soil carbon and uh, greenhouse gas fluxes in a, in a number of wetlands, ranging from Carpinteria up by Santa Barbara all the way down to the Tijuana uh, Natural, National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, I will just point out that there is a particular site in Southern California that is missing on this map. Let's see which one it is. It starts with a bolsa and ends with a chica, uh, which I'd love to expand this data set if the opportunity ever presented it. So over the past five years now, I've been working with a number of colleagues to look at these blue carbon issues in these wetlands up and down the Southern California coast. Uh, a lot of this work, as I said, has been done with my undergraduate students at Chapman University. For those of you not familiar with Chapman, we are a primarily undergraduate institution. And I think one of the really valuable contributions that I've made, so I've, I've done some science, which I think is interesting. I think the more important contribution that I've made is that I have brought 50 or so Chapman undergraduates into Southern California wetlands who have never set foot in a Southern California wetland before. That is valuable. That is the thing that I'm really pleased with myself about as a Chapman professor. And it's been tons of fun. For those of you that are affiliated with, uh, with Bolsa Chica, you may, may recognize Bolsa Chica's own Morgan Brown, who's now a master's student with Christine Whitcraft at Cal State Long Beach. She was an undergraduate with me working on some of this work. Again, I'm really, really pleased to see that I've had that sort of impact on the, on the future generation of wetland ecologies. Um, one of the things that we do is we measure greenhouse gas flux, right? This is my bread and butter. It's not very hard, you know, but I can measure how much methane comes off of a wetland. So one of the first things we did is we said, well, look, part of the whole value of coastal systems and why we want to try and restore them is that, yeah, they suck away a lot of carbon, but they're also not releasing methane. This is one of these assumptions that we make based in basic ecology that nobody actually bothers to go out and measure. So we bothered to go out and measure it. And we've measured methane flux from all of these different wetlands up and down the Southern California coast. And I'm really happy to say that in this case, it works like we think it should work, right? So here we've just got a flux rate, how much methane or how much carbon dioxide comes off of these ecosystems. The gray bars here show that indeed they're releasing carbon dioxide. That is exactly what we would expect. The black bars here show methane and notice the complete absence of black bars here. Indeed, these coastal ecosystems, as we would suspect based on our ecology, under ecological understanding, are not producing a lot of methane. You asked some questions about what are the thresholds. We've done uh, some work as a community to define those thresholds. This is just salinity versus methane flux. And as you can see, you have to get down to really brackish, almost all the way fresh conditions, below three parts per thousand salinity numbers, before you start to see measurable methane coming off of these systems. Is that why there's a small lump there at Newport? Newport, Newport is up, interesting. Upper Bay? That is in a Spartina stand. So everything else that we've done, most of these other graphs come from pickleweed, sort of dominated, you know, higher marsh things. Spartina, which has tons of carbon in the soil, actually makes a small amount of methane. And it's the only site that I've studied so far that makes measurable amounts of methane. And it has to do with the fact of, so if I put you in your box, you can use up your oxygen. I can make you use up that oxygen more if I make you work harder, right? If you're burning more energy. One of the ways I can make microbes work harder and burn more energy is to give them more food. So this Spartina, which is this juicy, high carbon, delicious sandwich for a microbe, 
actually may be allowing them to just crank and develop really big microbial populations, which may be sucking up all the sulfate from the seawater faster than it can be replenished. It's the only site I've seen it at, and that's just a hypothesis. The other thing that you've already brought up is that can we make these things make methane? So those are actual fluxes that I measured in the field. Right? I went out, I put my bucket on, I measured the fluxes. Here what I did is I took soils from these same systems, put them in mason jars in the lab, and let them sit for a week right? without new sulfate coming in. Same color coding here, CO2 and methane. Notice here that these systems can produce methane. There is the potential for them to produce methane if they use up their sulfate. So thinking about what that means for designing restoration plans to make sure you maximize tidal exchange, thinking about what this might mean for brackish areas in a larger wetland environment, I think has, is something that we should be thinking about and that these data talk about. Hey, please. Do you have any data on, the, on, on sulfate or other sulfur compounds? Your graphing with salinity is very strong, very it is. compelling. Yeah. Um, perhaps it's so uh, sorry. It could be. It could be. It, it could absolutely be, and it's not mutually exclusive, of course, right? It could be. So we know that sulfate and chloride and sodium exist in relatively predefined roles in seawater, right? You can get these from a, a chemistry textbook when you buy artificial seawater for your saltwater aquarium. Those ratios are relatively consistent. Um, we use salinity because, honestly, it's much easier to measure, right? You put it in your little drop thing, and you look up at the sun, and your refractometer tells you what it is. Um, there's been more work, there, there has been some work done showing that it can be related to sulfate, right? But we can't yet do this large multi-site comparison that they've done in the literature with salinity. And part of that is that because salinity or sulfate is so much harder to measure, it's not reported as well in the literature. Everybody measures salinity, right? It's much harder to measure sulfate, but you could look for that. Look for the fact of what actually drives that relationship mechanistically. Is it important? That is. That's the other question. Is, is it of any practical importance to us collectively, whether it's the, the it's a, levels or the It's a great levels? question. As long as there's this big difference and everybody recognizes As long as you've got exposure to seawater, if you're not getting methane, do, so, so I think it's important because I'm a biogeochemist and that sort of foolish mechanistic question is what I do for a living. But thinking about it from a conservation or management perspective, does it matter? Right? If all you need to know is that seawater influence means that we don't get any net methane flux, are we okay with that? I suppose it would matter if you were attempting to suppress methane production in a freshwater system. That's right. Well, and they do this in rice all the time. So rice ecosystems oftentimes do this by selectively dumping in other electron acceptors to limit their methane production. Go ahead. Because I know that ecosystem services is an angle that's being used now that's to encourage right. conservation, restoration, mm -hmm, and preservation. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying that with the goal to restore wetlands would be to increase tidal flow to make this ecosystem service more valuable. That's right. So, but historically, many of the wetlands in Southern California were closed systems, and uplands were a part of that about freshwater. So. There's a risk of a kind of a monoculture up and down our coast if we are to sell restoration in this way, right? So absolutely right, right? I mean, look, this is an ecosystem service, right? right? It is not the only ecosystem service. And I think as with any conservation or management conversation, there are constantly going to be trade-offs, right? I am not suggesting that we now only create wetlands because right. they sequester carbon. And this idea of... Um, so Rich Ambrose, who's at UCLA, does anybody yeah. know Rich? He has this, he's sort of coined this term of a Frankenmarsh. And what we right. want to avoid is this kind of disastrous science fiction-y wetland that's sole purpose is to sequester carbon. Where we go out and we plant some invasive, fast-growing plant and we cause it to flood in unnatural ways and there's no bird habitat and it doesn't provide any sort of aesthetic value, but it's really good at sequestering carbon. What we don't want is policies that encourage that, right? Or I would agree with Rich at least. Maybe we do want that. I would agree with Rich that that is not what I'd like to see come out of this conversation. But I don't know that that's any different than thinking about any other ecosystem service. Yeah. Right? You're always faced with these challenges, I suspect. And maybe not all wetlands are good at this. 
or, or should be viewed this way. Maybe Southern California is the exact wrong place to think about blue carbon because these systems do tend to be closed uh, and, and tend to have these freshwater pieces to them or these brackish pieces Wide to them. diversity. Yeah, so maybe we choose to, with the few limited salt marshes we have left, value other ecosystem services a little bit more than we value blue carbon. But maybe we want blue carbon to at least be a part of that decision. I understand the ecosystem services approach, but I do fear that it denigrates the the value of the whole in it's, a lot of ways. And I know it's sort of last ditch effort and you're trying to convert that you're not preaching to the choir when you're pushing that. Right? It is a, it is it's a, just such a, it's a sticky wicket. Look, it? if it was a simple solution, we would have found it all. That's correct. Right, and I think ecosystem services, like any other conservation um, shift and paradigm in the way we think about these things, I suspect is just a reflection of that complexity, right? Noah, when they talk about this, and they have a great podcast on blue carbon, you know, they really end by saying, this is not about carbon for us. This is a way about drawing more attention to the value of these coastal ecosystems. And if there are policies that we can put in place that help us conserve and restore and create them, maybe we want to at least think about what those policies would look like. And I, you know, that reflects my personal right. uh, view on the topic as well. Yeah. yeah. Let me just show you one more data slide here, focus on the other thing. Uh, that I've been measuring here, this idea of soil carbon storage. So I think I've, I've, I've hopefully convinced you that uh, methane doesn't seem to be a major issue as long as we have some sort of tidal influence, at least the net flux of methane in these ecosystems. The other thing that we've been measuring here is uh, soil carbon storage. So this is great fun, right? So we take this big core, it's 15 centimeters in diameter, it goes down about 50 centimeters, we drag it out in the field with a crew of, of undergraduates, and depending on how strong and heavy they are, depends on how far we can shove this thing down in the soil. And then we got to get a bunch of them to pull it back out, right? I mean, it's our risk management people love this because I show <laughs> pictures like this, right? Um, so then we, we drag this thing out of the ground, and then we cut it into depth increments. We section those depth increments into a couple centimeter increments. Here's Morgan Brown again, for those of you that know her. And then we take those depth increments back into the lab, and we measure soil carbon. We measure, we can actually measure the amount of carbon that exists per area in these wetlands. And this is something that we've been doing at the Huntington Beach sites. So we've done this at Talbert, we've done this at Brookhurst, we measured those two wetlands in 2011. More recently we've done this at Magnolia and we've actually done this at Newland, pre-restoration, which we think is actually really great data that we're very excited to follow up on. My hope with all of this stuff is that Chapman won't fire me. And that every so often what we can do is take a new group of 20 students back to these same sites and develop a long-term data set to look at how these things are changing. So that's my secret plan for uh, soil carbon in Southern California. This is some data that we, we published. Um, and again, my contribution here is not the science, it's the students. This is a paper that we published in the Bulletin of the Southern California Academy of Sciences. It has 10 undergraduate co-authors on it. Right? These are all undergraduates that are going into the world having published a scientific paper in the peer-reviewed literature. And I think that's super cool. Um, so here's what we did. We went out to Brookhurst at the time. It had been restored for only two years. We went out to Talbert at the time. It had been restored for 22 years. We took these big soil cores. We went back into the lab, and we measured the amount of carbon. And this is really common what you see. This is very typical of what you see. Right? Lots of carbon in the surface where all the fresh plants are. It uh, gets decomposed as that carbon gets buried. And down at the bottom, you end up with relatively small percentages of carbon per uh, mass of soil. So this is a mass of carbon per mass of soil, basically. And we see this really typical depth profile, right? If this whole thing works, blue carbon works, and you can restore a wetland to sequester more carbon from the atmosphere, which wetland should have more carbon in it? The new one that's only been there for two years, or the old one that's been there for 22 years? The old one, right? Which one has more carbon in it? The new one. This is where the science gets really tricky, right? What? Like, this is not how it's supposed to work. Curses, how are we ever supposed to model this thing if what we say is a wetland that's been totally drained for, for what, since the 40s probably in Brookers? We restore it for two years and suddenly it's got more carbon in it than the same one right down the road that's been restored for 22 years. There are a lot of interesting scientific questions that we still need to explore around this idea of soil carbon. Um, we're doing some really great stuff right now with Orange High School students. I know high school education is another goal of Bolsa Chica. We're starting to engage them in this work as well. 
we've actually demonstrated that there are very good relationships between the amount of total organic matter in the soil. That's something that's very easy to measure. You take soil, you put it in a crucible, you burn it. You know how much total organic matter you have in the soil. We've demonstrated with these, under, or with these high school students that the amount of organic matter that you have in Southern California wetlands is related to the amount of carbon. Carbon is much harder to measure. You need a $50,000 piece of equipment to do that. You don't need to do that anymore. You now need an oven and crucibles, and you can tell me how much carbon is in your Southern California salt marsh soil. Other people have done this, right? Um, the relationship that we see between organic matter and carbon in Southern California salt marshes is almost identical to the relationship that people see in North Carolina salt marshes and that people see in San Francisco Bay Area salt marshes. That, to me, is a really interesting pattern. Right? It suggests that many of these systems, despite being very different, carbon and organic matter are tightly coupled and are tightly coupled in relatively constant and predictive ways. In contrast, we can also show that the amount of nitrogen that you store, a different ecosystem service, the amount of nitrogen is also tightly related to the amount of organic matter in a soil. Again, now a consultant can go out and measure this, which is easy to do. They don't need to measure nitrogen. They can approximate it. But that relationship looks to be really different depending on where you are. Right? That's really interesting, too. Why is it that North Carolina wetlands differ in this relationship for nitrogen and organic matter, but not for carbon? This idea of if blue carbon works the way we think it does, then what you should be able to do is start off with an unrestored wetland, which should have a very small amount of carbon in it because it's been oxidized for long periods of time. You restore tidal influence, you bring it back, you do the job that you all have done well here, and that I think Huntington Beach has done well there. Carbon should accumulate through time. Okay? We can test that. Because in this data set that we have, we've gone around to a bunch of different wetlands that vary in age from two years post-restoration to 22 years post-restoration. This graph should look like this. It doesn't look anything like that. Right? It is unfortunately not as simple as we would like it to be ecologically. And there are site-specific factors or other unique things about each of these sites that is going to make it very, very challenging to really understand how much carbon you get. What this means is that I can't just say, I'm going to create a new wetland that's going to be this big, I'm going to let it run for 100 years, and this is how much carbon it's going to have. It's not a straight line relationship. It doesn't even look to be a nonlinear relationship. The other thing that I'll point out that comes back to your question is um, when we look at our Southern California wetlands compared to global averages, they tend to store a little bit less carbon than many of these other salt marsh ecosystems we find in other parts on the planet. So maybe Southern California is not the right place for this after all, right? Maybe we want to invest our limited restoration resources if we're restoring just to sequester carbon in places that are above this average line. And maybe we want to think about other ecosystem services that Southern California wetlands might do really, really well and not so much about carbon, okay? So um, let me just sort of wrap up and say that, you know, look, we all know wetlands are really valuable. They perform all of these ecosystem services for us. I am not advocating that blue carbon needs to be the model as we move forward with conservation and management. All I'm trying to do with this conversation is show you that people are thinking about this as additional, an, another additional ecosystem service that may or may not be valuable for future conservation and restoration efforts of these coastal vegetated ecosystems. So let me just thank everybody, um, lots of colleagues on this, including Rich Ambrose and Kate, Kate Elgin at uh, UCLA, Monique Myers, who works at California Sea Grant, uh, and again, lots and lots of great student help, uh, especially my students at Chapman University. So thanks very much, and if there's further questions, I'm happy to continue this conversation.